You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Hello, world, and welcome to Tales from Hollywoodland, a veritable feast of movies. Broadway, showbiz stories, news and gossip with Julian Schlossberg, Arthur E. Friedman, and Stephen J. Rudman. Today we talk all about empowered women in film and television. And now, here's Julian, Arthur, and Steve. Thanks, Mike. Uh, what a topic, guys. I mean, women. Uh, I'm still studying them after six, seventy two years. But in Hollywood, uh, I think women have made tremendous strides. We've got a lot to talk about across many eras. All right. Well, let's talk in terms of the beginning of film just quickly and say at the beginning or the silent movies, they would say the girl, the guy, the villain, the cowboy. They didn't have names. And the producers didn't want them to have names because they were concerned what would happen if they became too powerful. Well, the America's sweetheart was known as Mary Pickford, except Mary Pickford was from Canada. Right off the bat, false advertising. But okay, Mary Pickford, America's sweetheart, becomes the first woman in film to get, think of this, $10,000 a week. But more importantly, forms her own production company, and then has a percentage of the film profits. That's how big she was. Now, as you guys know, especially Arthur, she was one of the founders of United Artists. Mary Pickford, along with Douglas Fairbanks, D.W. Griffith, and uh, Charlie Chaplin, they, they all founded United Artists. So Mary Pickford was the very first real woman of power. She also was one of the people who started the Motion Picture Academy and the Motion Picture Relief Fund. So that's Mary. I'll leave that you guys to go. I'll come back with some other actresses, but there's the uh, lady who started it all and scared the hell out of Adolf Zucker. <laughs> and I want to mention something that's important in show business. To, to, to understand that Mary Pickford was part of United Artists, the United Artists, Douglas Fairbanks, uh, Charlie Chaplin, Mary Pickford, they started that because they all felt even at 10000 a week, which was Charlie Chaplin's salary, they were still getting screwed. That's why they, they formed their own company. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's true. And, and so, you know, uh, somewhere along the line, Lou Wasserman came into the picture and straightened everything out. Steve, what's your story? What do you got to tell us about empowered women? Well, I, you know, you guys, I usually defer to you guys for the uh, 30 and 40s, but I have to say that Mae West was her own woman. And if when Mae West probably first walked out on, on, on the silver screen, she was very captivating and you didn't push Mae West around. I think she was the, one of the first women who basically had a little more control over their character. I, you know, I, I think of Mary Pickford, I think of the classic damsel in distress. I don't know if they tied Mary Pickford to a railroad track, but my impression <laughs> is a lot of women in the, in the twenties in those silent movies were kind of always being rescued by the guys. And later on, I'm going to talk about how that's been flipped. But I think that uh, Mae West stands out for me. I'm sure Jean Harlow had a quality of empowerment as, the, the, during her short career, sadly. Uh, and then, of course, Arthur talks about Joan Crawford. Well, Joan Crawford was a power, um, but uh, the woman that I would like to discuss in terms of empowerment was a great, great lady, and her name is Sherry Lansing, who the first time I met Sherry was about late 1970s when she was head of production at Columbia. Uh, and um, the, company I was, the company I was consulting with at that time in Boston uh, was uh, owned at theaters in, in the city of Boston, but uh, the, the company that bought them was Hudson Pharmaceuticals. And the head of Hudson Pharmaceuticals told me and my colleague that in these rights that we bought from uh, from uh, this, this other pharmaceutical company, believe it or not, they have something called Marvel Comics. So we own Marvel Comics. When you're out in L.A., why don't you see if you can pitch it and see what you can do with it? And we pitched it at Columbia to Norman Levy, our friend Norman Levy. 
and many other studios, by the way, and Sherry Lansing and everybody said, nah, you know, that was 1979 Marvel Comics. Think about mm-hmm. that. Sherry Lansing was head of production at, at Columbia. Uh, from there, she uh, went to uh, become an independent producer and produced some tremendous uh, hit movies, uh, including Fatal Attraction. She worked with uh, Stanley Jaffe uh, and um, very successful uh, at that. Uh, she went on to uh, uh, become uh, uh, a producer and then a, a real a, a head of production, I think, at Fox, uh, where she, again, was outstanding. And then she became, uh, she produced more movies, successful movies. Uh, but she then went on to head Paramount, became the studio head of Paramount, the first woman to be the studio head. And she was great. I want to tell one fast story. So I'm working with Redford on a movie called uh, uh, River Runs Through It. Uh, and he asked me to meet him for lunch on the set of Indecent Proposal, which was being produced at the time by Sherry Lansing. And uh, I remember that day so well. Uh, so anyway, I saw Sherry come onto the set in the background. She's a producer of the movie, always in the background, just going. She's very classy. She had a great style about herself. Uh, and she headed Paramount uh, successfully, really successfully for years. Uh, so hats off to Sherry Lansing. Uh, is, is if I had to choose one empowered uh, woman who has really made it, and and a lot of the women who have made it since really stand on her shoulders. Uh, so uh, here's to Sherry Lansing. Anyway, well, you know she was known for returning every single phone call, mm-hmm. and I was one of those callers one day because I had combat over there. Combat was in play, and she bought it from the Savoy where we had set it up. And she returned my call, and she couldn't have been nicer. She was, uh, you know, I don't know if you call a woman a gentleman, because you don't really call a woman a gentleman, but she was the female equivalent of a gentleman. Uh, we call that a lady, I think. <laughs> she yeah. was a true lady. There you yeah, go. As in, lady, as in <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. I knew, I knew Sherry very well. And when she was at Paramount, I had the remake rights to Lily, the movie Lily, because uh, it had been made into a Broadway show called Carnival. And I went to see you. She came to New York. We had our lunch. And at lunch, I said, well, I'm going to talk to you about a project that I don't even know if you'll know about. I said, the uh, movie Lily was made into a Broadway show called Carnival. And she threw down her knife and fork and said, that's the very first show I ever saw on Broadway. I want to make a deal. (laughs) And that's, that's how I made the deal with Carnival, even though I must say, to this day, it still hasn't been made. But anyhow, we had a nice time together for 18 months where they optioned it and continued to pay, but we didn't make the deal. But I did like her. Steve, when you mentioned Mae West, we should mention that she basically wrote her own material. So she had even more power because as a writer, as you know, a writer and the star, she really wielded great power. She was the second highest paid woman in the United States. Uh, second, no, let me rephrase that. She was the highest paid woman in the United States, but the second of every human being. Who was the first, do you think? Uh, my jump reaction is Charlie Chaplin. William Randolph Hearst. Oh, and, wow. And she was number two. That may was. I, I wonder if, I wonder if she was a saver. I wonder <laughs> if she held on to her well. You know, George Raft was in a movie with her, her first movie. And his quote was, she she stole everything, including the camera. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we should also acknowledge, as we've done in a couple of our sex shows, that this is the period of the censors. So women like Mae West had to have their, their challenges in getting some of their material done on the big screen for a very conservative censor bureau. That's true. That's true. How about I want to the- talk. I, I'd like to talk a little bit how times have changed and how they've affect popular entertainment. I think two two things I have to say had an effect on the way females are portrayed in film. Number one, the fact that women were admitted to the police departments as officers, and they were also admitted eventually to the army, navy. Marines, Air Force, as soldiers and sailors and air people. So I think that uh, the the fact that women could fight had a definite impact, particularly in the last 30 years on or 30 years plus 
on the way they're portrayed. Now, I mentioned earlier that, you know, in the 20s, women were the damsels in distress, whether they were tied to the railroad track or not. But I remember seeing a movie. It wasn't probably the first one, but I remember seeing a movie in the mid 80s called Heavy Metal. And Heavy Metal was an animated film. It was released by Ivan Reitman's company. And in the body of the uh, of that movie, and it's a, it's a very sexy, by the way, it's a very sexy animated feature. It was definitely an R-rated feature. And in the body of that movie was a character named Tarna. Mike, do you remember Tarna? It's very hard to forget Tarna. Tarna was the epitome of a female warrior. Magnificent figure, dressed in armor or whatever, and she has a she's a sword wielding character, and this is long before Conan, uh, the feature Conan with Arnold, and she she just fights the heck out of things, and it was starting to be a a thing. Now two years earlier, Sigourney Weaver starred in the first Alien movie, and in the first Alien movie, she becomes the hero that ends up fighting the alien in Ridley Scott's classic. Uh, five years later in Aliens, which is the sequel to Alien, she's a member of the combat team that goes into the planet to fight the aliens, which are swarming over the planet. So between Sigourney Weaver, Tarna, and then I'll mention some other characters. When the Disney started to make their animated features, the women were just not just sex objects or just damsels in distress. They had a character named Mulan who became a female warrior in Japan, or actually it was China. And um, a lot of things were happening in the film world, but not only in film, in television in the 1960s. One of my favorite shows was The Avengers with Diana Rigg and Patrick McNee. Now, if you saw Diana Rigg in action on the Avengers television series, she was a female warrior. And she's kind of the template for all the female warriors that followed. But I think, Steve, that once we start speaking of empowered women uh, in the film business, in TV, we, we can't go a step further without mentioning Lucille Ball uh, for the things that she did. Uh, not only I Love Lucy, uh, along with Desi Arnaz, but the revolution of it all. Uh, sitcoms uh, evolved from 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 that. Uh, she brought in uh, he, she and her husband and Desi Arnaz uh, shot their shows on film. Uh, she was a powerful person uh, and as big a star as television has ever had. I don't and, think it can be argued. We have to say she became the first woman to own her own production company, along with. Desi Arnaz. Desi Lou, yes. And she also started syndication, film syndication, was under Desi, Desi Lou. And think of all the shows that were done for Desi Lou, a lot of TV shows. So she was a powerhouse and someone you couldn't reckon with. We also have to talk, if we're doing television quickly, uh, to, about Marlo Thomas and Mary Tyler Moore both of whom had their own production companies. Marlo came up with the idea for that girl. And that girl, I believe, historically, was the very first single woman not living with her parents, having a job, living alone in New York. And then Mary came along with, of course, Mary Tyler Moore Show. So, and but the interesting thing is uh, Marlo thought of that idea because she kind of mirrored her own life. She wanted to be an actress. Danny Thomas didn't want her to be an actress, but she she left L.A. and came to New York. So I think between Lucy, who I agree with you, Arthur, was number one. But Lucy, uh, but uh, Marlo and uh, and Mary, very, very big in TV as well. Wow. How would you guys rate Carol Burnett? Terrific. Huge. Terrific. Star. Terrific. Big Joe, star. Her husband, Joe Hamilton, was uh, the producer and put the stuff together. But she was great, and everyone loved her, and she was a terrific person. Fran Drescher is a friend, and she tells a great story of how the nanny happened. She was flying from, I believe, Paris <clears throat> to New York or to L.A., and it was in first class and realized that she was sitting next to Jeff Zagansky, who was the head of CBS. And so she went into the, into the bathroom, fixed herself up as good as she could, and she sat down next to Jeff and, and pitched him. A sound of Music, uh, or Mary Poppins, a Sound of Music, with a Jewish girl. Uh, and uh, <laughs> by the time the by the time the plane landed, he 
he decided he would he would do the show. And that's how the nanny started. And it's been a huge success for Fran, for for Renee Taylor, for so many all these people who were involved with it. It ran for five years and is in syndication forever. Uh, Franny's terrific and smart and uh, now is the head of uh, SAG-AFTRA. And she negotiated a very good deal for them uh, in in the last strike uh, attempt. But, uh, they, you know, look, it's hard to speak about any empowered women without getting involved with Barbara Streisand, who was a powerhouse, uh, huge talent in the business end of it and all. It was just brilliant. Uh, fast, funny story. Uh, I had had a meeting with Sherry Lansing, going back there for a second. And the night before, I'd seen a special screening of uh, the, they, they, they did a whole uh, remake, not a remake, but. They, they enhance the, uh, the quality of Funny Girl. And if you look close, Sherry Lansing's in that movie. And so I told her, I said, you know, I, I saw you last night in, in Funny Girl. What? You know, it, it, at this time, she was the head of Paramount. Uh, and she, oh, my goodness, I'm so embarrassed about that. Her whole role was with Nikki Onstein. He, she picked a head in the door and said, Nikki, are you coming? That was it. Yeah. Uh, but you saw her. That was her first, uh, first you know, big time <laughs> film. When we talk power. about women and power, there's a great story of Catherine Hepburn, which I always thought was just sensational. Catherine Hepburn, as we know, was a huge star in the 30s, and then she hit a terrible period. She became, as far as the exhibitors were concerned, poison, box office poison. So she went to, to Broadway, and she went to do a show called The Philadelphia Story. Before the show opened, she was dating Howard Hughes. She said to Howard Hughes, I need the rights. Buy the rights for me. I want the rights to the Philip Barry play before the play opened. He bought it for her and gave it to her. When it was this giant success, she decided she's the only way the movies are going to be made. That movie will be made is if she stars in it. And that movie turned her whole career around. Now, that's quite a story about a woman having power and, of course, in, in some case, using the man to get the thing. But she was smart enough to do it, smart enough to do it. Look where it's come today, though. Look how, how things have happened. Donna Langley is the head of Universal. Amy Pascal, who was the head of Columbia, uh, now produces very successfully. Women are all over the place. God bless them. They are the, the powerful lawyers. Uh, they are now doctors, of course. They're all over. God bless them. Women have, uh, I don't want to say taken over, but they are they have, I believe, uh, you know, become uh, uh, people who we all look up to uh, in, in the film industry for sure. And now but Greta they're, Gerwig they're, becomes the first woman director to have done a billion-dollar movie. Greta Gerwig, absolutely. A ghost, you know, it's, uh, it's great. Two names that come to mind immediately, just like you just said, Barbie and Taylor Swift. I mean, is there anyone bigger? In fact, I think I just read that uh, Taylor Swift is uh, Time Magazine's Person of the Year. Steve, Taylor Swift has revolutionized the NFL, of all things. Because what <laughs> happened is since she's had an affair with uh, Travis Kelsey of, the, uh, of uh, Kansas City, and she's in the booth when, during his games. They keep shifting the camera to her. And they have developed a demographic they never had, which is young women, young girls who are fans of Taylor Swift. So uh, that, like the NFL needs it. It's the most successful sport that's out there. But uh, the, the teams have been notoriously very rigid about their players. Uh, and, you know, you stick to the script and you got to stick to the team and, and, and you, know, you got, can't be late. And uh, Travis Kelsey wanted to go see her in, uh, I believe, Singapore or something in a concert, which would have, you know, taken away his ability to practice that week. And his coach, who got instructions from the commissioner of, of NFL, said, let him go. Let him go. Anything to keep, to keep the, you know, the, the young girls watching football, which has never happened before. So, uh, you know, there well, you go. Another thing that's so interesting for me or uh, that was the actresses in the 40s who stood up to the studio heads, both Betty Davis, two-time Academy Award winner, and Olivia de Havilland. Both of them said, we don't want to be told that we can't say no to a movie. We're, we know we're contract players, but we don't yeah. want to just be told that's all we can do. Both of them sued. Both of them won. 
and as they actually call the de Havilland Law from Olivia sure. de Havilland. Betty Davis went to London, riding on a pony. No, Betty Davis went to London and made a movie without a studio uh, called Another Man's Poison with her Gary Merrill. And uh, it was produced by Douglas Feb Hanks Jr. And I'm happy to say I was the distributor for many, many years. But Jack Warner came to his senses. She came back. She had choices of her roles, as did de Havilland. Two women, huge power, who used it and won. Did Betty Davis win the Academy Award for All About Eve? I'm trying to think if that I, – I, I don't know. I don't know. It's, Steve, do you know? I can look it up really quickly. It wasn't Anne, um, Anne Bancroft. Not, not, it was it uh, – Anne Baxter. Anne, Anne Baxter. Baxter. She didn't win, yeah. did she? Well, even if she did, it wouldn't have been for Best Actress, probably yeah. Best Supporting, I would think. Yeah. yeah. How, how great is that movie? And that Terrific. movie is about as great as it can be. And how great is Joseph Mankiewicz, who wrote yes. and directed it, you know? Of course. How about George Sanders in that movie? George how about Sanders. everybody in that movie? Julian, how about everybody? everybody including yeah. Marilyn. Including Marilyn Monroe and and, uh, and others. Uh, yeah, Gary, okay, here's Gary. the deal on All About Eve. Um Won six Oscars. Uh, George Sanders won for Best Supporting. Joe Mankiewicz won for Best Directing and for Best Writing. Best Costume Design, uh, Best uh, Sound, and, of course, it won Best Picture. But Ann Baxter and Betty Davis were nominated but did not win. Who did also, win? Did you say, Steve? Um, I have to look that Who up. Could have won? Who could have won that year over over Ann Baxter and uh, Betty Davis? I, I want to say that, uh, and I'm not 100%, but the, was Gloria Swanson the winner that year for Sunset, Sunset Boulevard? Was, was that 50? Was that 1950 or so? Uh, let's see. That was the year 1950. Yeah. And I'm looking it up right now. While you're doing Imagine that. In one, in, one year, in one year, we had Sunset Boulevard and All About Eve and God knows what else. Yeah. Compared to what's, what you're looking at today. But as you know, Arthur, 1939 is even a better year. Better, yeah. Great. Well, but while Steve's looking that up, I want to say that George Sanders has one of the great lines. When Marilyn Monroe, this beautiful starlet, walks into this party... Uh, someone says, who is she? And uh, Sanders says, she went to the Copacabana School of Acting. Right. That's right. <laughs> Written by uh, Joe Michael. Michael. Okay. Michael. Yeah. 1950 Oscars. Best Actress, yeah. Judy Holliday for Born Yesterday. Oh. Best 30. Actress, Cyrano de Bergerac was uh, Jose Ferrer playing Cyrano de Bergerac. Yep. Um, who's, best, who's Best Supporting Actress, Steve? Best Supporting Actress was Josephine Hull for Harvey. Oh. Really? Yeah. Oh, my Lord. I know, of course. But still, who would have been Supporting Actress with All About Eve? Ann Baxter? Ann Baxter, yeah. And Celeste Holm. Celeste Holm. They they might have knocked each other off being nominated, just like Burt Lancaster and Monty Cliff probably knocked each other off three years later for From Here to Eternity so that... Bill Holden could win for Stalag 17. Didn't Sinatra win from, from Here to Eternity? Yeah. Oh. yeah. And Donna Reed. Supporting actor. Supporting You know, my friend, uh, my friend Paul Clemens, his mother was Eleanor Parker. And Eleanor Parker turned down the Deborah Carr role in, uh, in From Here to Eternity. And she later regretted it. I'd like to talk about some actresses of late. In the last 30 years that have been empowered through their characters. Remember, I mentioned earlier that when women were uh, entered into law enforcement, kind of changed the way they're perceived in mystery and thriller movies. So 1990, you've got Silence of the Lambs, right. big hit, won the best picture that year. And Jodie Foster plays an FBI agent. Well, you know, that's pretty empowered, if you ask me. And, of course, she's through the whole movie as she battles uh, the the wonderful um, character uh, Anthony Hopkins and Hannibal Lecter. Hannibal Lecter, thank you, Julian. Uh, that that was terrific. But it used to be, it used to be, and not that many years ago, I don't think. Uh, it used to be where studio execs at every major studio were men. Women are all over the place in in the studios. God bless them, uh, as they should be, but. It, it they've made tremendous progress. So you know what, whatever was happening with women fifty, sixty years ago is such was shameful. 
Uh, their talent uh, is obvious. It's incredible in all fields of the entertainment business and otherwise. They're still oh. fighting for the director's chair, though, even though Greta Gerwig gets a lot of attention this year for directing Barbie. I still think it's a smaller percentage, and I think that uh, there's still a smaller percentage of producers as women. They'll uh, get there, though. They will get there. Another, but, another but, actress I want to mention right after uh, – Jodie Foster did Silence of the Lambs. The following year, 1991, uh, we have a James Bond movie with Pierce Brosnan called Tomorrow Never Dies. And um, Michelle Yeoh was the Chinese agent matched uh, alongside James Bond. And, of course, Michelle Yeoh has become a big deal of late. She was very much involved with all uh, everything uh, all at once. The the movie that won Best Picture last year. She's become a big action star. Uh, this she did Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Uh, so uh, I think she's an empowered woman and woman in many ways, especially through her character. Another character of note is uh, Angelina Jolie, the Tomb Raider, who was a female Indiana Jones. And you see a lot of female versions. Of male characters, we've got the female Ghostbusters. We've got the female Ocean's Eight. I mean, women have literally taken over a good chunk of stories in Hollywood. As in Wonder Woman. Yeah. As in Wonder Woman, Gal Gadot. Is there any more empowered woman than Gal Gadot as the, the as the Wonder Woman? I want to go back to production for a moment and mention someone who is uh, known within the industry, certainly. And I got to know, and she's terrific, a, a, a lady named Gail Mutrix, uh, who, when I met her, she was involved with Barry Levinson in, the, in producing uh, a lot of Barry's stuff, including Rain Man. Uh, Gail is in, was involved with Donnie Brasco. Uh, Gail is terrific. She, she knows the business in so many different ways, went on to do Kinsey on, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, several other uh, key movies. Uh, she was involved with the production of Quiz Show which was a great movie uh, that Redford directed. Uh, and um, again, I just think that the, the empowerment of women in production in the business end of movies and television uh, is, I, I'd like to think it's equalized with, with anyone. I think that women are just part of the game now, as it should be. And well, especially in story. That's the way it should be. But as you, you both have pointed out, in the director's chair, it's, the history is a disgrace. Not it's yet, unbelievable. Yeah. Dorothy Osno was the first woman director who was the first woman director of the Directors Guild. A gay woman. She was uh, made films for about 16 years. She's credited, guys, with the boom mic. It was her idea to take a fishing rod and put a mic at the end of it and hold it over. That was her, Dorothy Osner. Julian, who is the woman who came out of uh, Hitler's Germany uh, as a filmmaker? Oh, Lenny Le Le Reifenstahl. Le Le yeah, Le Le yes, Lenny Reifenstahl. Le Le what, was she? Was she? Was she as good a, a filmmaker as we were led to believe? I think she. It? I think Triumph of the Will is an extraordinary movie. I no. do. Yes, I think she was. What happened to her after the war? I I don't really know. I don't. I know she wasn't Dorothy Osner. So uh, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't really know. I just want to let you guys know that Dar Ar Dorothy Osner was taught at UCLA, and her prize student, who she he who claims he learned so much from her, was Francis Freud Coppola. Hmm. So it's kind of interesting. We talked about standing on other people's shoulders. Going back just quickly to the old silent movies. I wonder if you guys ever heard of a woman named Alice Guy. And then she became Alice Guy Blush. But believe it or not, this woman who headed up Gaumont Production in France made between seven, according to the net, between 700 and 1,000 movies and was incredible in starting her own company in America called Solax, S-O-L-A-X. So every once in a while, these women would come in. They 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 give the credit to D. W. Griffith for the invention of the close-up. My history shows that Alice Guy did it before he did the close-up in a movie. So it's interesting that these few women made an uh, an impression. We know Ida Lupino, 
a fine actress, uh, a British born, but certainly thought of as American, who, who directed hundreds of television sh- sh- shows and, and a lot of good movies. I'm sure Steve and Lafay, you know, a couple of those movies like The Hitchhiker and some others, right? Well, yes. also, you know, at the famous battle between Cecil B. DeMille and Joe Mankiewicz at the right at the Directors Guild on October 22nd, 1950, where 600 directors showed up to witness this battle over the uh, over the uh, loyalty oath. Lida Lupino was the only woman director in the room. 1950. Yeah, pretty crazy. Now, on a more contemporary note, I want to mention Catherine Bigelow. You know, the, you, you generally think of women directing romantic comedies, you know, chick flicks. Catherine Bigelow is the exact opposite. Catherine Bigelow directs very male, high testosterone action pictures. She did Zero Dark Thirty. She then the year she won the Best Picture Oscar for The Hurt Locker, she beat her husband, who uh, did Avatar. So she beat him at his own game. Was that uh, her husband or her ex husband? Uh, I think it, you're right. I think it was her ex-husband. Yeah. Uh, but I think uh, Catherine has done a terrific uh, in tr- turning around the idea that women only direct women type pictures. I'd like to mention a couple other actresses who really gave us on-screen characters that twisted the whole idea of women being breathless. Uh, Uma Thurman in the Kill Bill movies for Quentin Tarantino. Kill, Uma Thurman is playing Steve McQueen as a woman. Basically, she's a kick-ass fighting machine with a sword. And if it was made in 1960, Steve McQueen probably would have played that part. She's terrific. Do you guys know the Kill Bill movies? Sure. I do. Yeah. Just they're, they're violent and, uh, as all get up. Not only do we know the Kill Bill movies, we knew Harvey. Oh, my God. Anyhow. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> yes. That is and the other woman who I think really killed it, particularly in the sequel, was Linda Hamilton in The Terminator. Uh, in Terminator 2, in fact, there was more press written about her muscles as she's doing those, uh, those chin-ups in T2, Judgment Day. And I got to work with Linda Hamilton. She starred in a movie I produced called Silent Night uh, for the Hallmark Channel, and she couldn't have been nicer. But Linda set some new scales for being an empowered, tough woman. Yeah. There's no question that there's two kinds of empowered women that we're talking about, or well, maybe three. One is, the, as Arthur started with the executives, uh, another is the women who actually not just playing the role, which is the number two, playing strong women, but not necessarily having that much power except in the the movie. And then finally, the women who really did stand up, take over their careers and make sure, you know, in making, even you take someone like Madonna, this woman created her career. She created it, uh, as did in many ways Marilyn Monroe. That, that's always interesting to me, the women who take it and make it. And then, uh, anyhow, I think that's a, a great subject that we've been battling. That's true. About. That's you. You done something very interesting. That's true. Uh, Madonna. Uh, you know, a lot of people say eh, Madonna is, is that she, Talking at, on a business basis, she created this persona. She created this character uh, and succeeded as much as anyone could possibly succeed, even as much as Tom Cruise, who decided he was going to become a movie star. And he spent his life becoming one. He did it. And he's great, to say the least. But she's great for what she does. Uh, you know, she uh, she became a Donna. Uh, it's like Jello. I, I think the the term movie star has really changed over the years. I, I one person really said that there are very few movie stars anymore. There are great actors, no question about it. But who puts who puts tushies in the seat anymore? And with a guarantee, you know, when John Wayne was making movies, you knew your marketing department knew how many people would go see a John Wayne movie or an Errol Flynn movie or a Bill Holden movie. Uh, today, I don't think anybody can guarantee anything. You could have Taylor Swift in a movie. Taylor Swift co-starred in Amsterdam with 12 major stars, and the movie did no business. Did you see the numbers on, did you see the numbers on her concert recently? 
Oh, I'm sure they're off the charts. They're off the chart. Yeah. And no, she but put it, I, I think it is true. I don't think we have Arthur. You kind of jump in on this, too. I don't think we have any star anymore that can guarantee the so-called tushies in the seats. Well, let's understand that in the golden age, stars were created by the studios. Uh, they were on every magazine cover. They were all over the place. Uh, the studios were, were creating these stars. Today, the people who are stars are, be, are doing it through independent ways, independent films, and, and they're, you know, they're kind of on their own. They're all free agents. Uh, you still have stars. I mean, The Rock, Dwayne Johnson puts people in seats. Uh, Kevin Hart puts people in seats. Uh, you don't have the abundance of them. My God, I mean, there used to be, uh, they probably were two dozen major stars well, from the age of the 40s look, and 50s. Look, look, at, look at Gal Gadot. Gal Gadot comes out of the box and, and the first Wonder Woman movie just kills it. And then they make the sequel and they really let her down. I thought that it was a terrible sequel. And even though she's great, they gave her just one of the lamest storylines. And I think that, I don't know if it's killed the, uh, the Wonder Woman franchise, but this has happened a few times lately. There was a big disaster last year at Warner's. They were about to uh, finalize the cut of Batgirl, which was going to be another big DC movie about, you know, Batgirl, the female equivalent of Batman. They shelved it. They never released it. It went into the toilet with a big splash. Is there a girl? Is there a girl today, an actress today, who guarantees box office? I don't think so. I mean, Scarlett Johansson and Charlize Theron have been in some big box office plus, winners. They're plus Charlize one. Theron was in Mad Max: Fury Road, and of course, uh, Scarlett Johansson does the Black Widow characters in the in the, the Marvel movies. But they don't guarantee you anything. No, they sure don't. I don't think Arthur there is a woman that you could call the guaranteed star. No. Agree. Yeah. Well, there's some pluses, uh, but uh, that's about it. I, I want to mention a few more women because of my association with the James Bond movies. I've been writing about them for years. In 1977, which is 50, uh, let's see, that's oh, 47, sorry, 40, 47. 47 years ago, Barbara Bach comes out of nowhere, a New York actress, and plays uh, um, uh, Anya Amasova, a Russian major opposite Roger Moore in The Spy Who Loved Me and was pretty kick-ass. I thought she was terrific. And then uh, a decade later, you had Famke Johnson in A Golden Eye and Grace Jones in A View to a Kill. The Bond movies empowered a lot of women to not just be the breathless females. And I think that was a plus. And then in 77, the same year as Barbara Bach, Carrie Fisher was in Star Wars. And if you remember, Carrie Fisher carries a laser pistol and she holds her own. Well, if you have a movie that is a so-called chick flick, a rom-com, something along the lines that will appeal to women at the box office, then women in, in mass are a star. Uh, there's nothing quite like the fever of, of a movie that comes out that appeals to women. Love Story was one of the great, great examples of that. Uh, there have been many through the years. Um, when when Harry Met Sally was a Harry Met one. Sally, Sleepless in Seattle. Yeah. Uh, now that's a that this is a kind of a movie that I don't see out there. It's unbelievable, but uh, those were romantic comedies and comedies in general have been supplanted by action pictures and horror films. It's very hard to sell a comedy in Hollywood to these days. I'm out there every day yeah. trying to sell comedy. And sometimes I feel like I'm selling shoes to uh, to pigeons. Well, because I think, Steve, that before you get a movie greenlit today at the studio level, uh, you need to know that they need to know it's going to do business in foreign markets. Uh, that's the golden goose. Uh, oh, and, and it's been proven as we grew up with domestic was king. Right. Now foreign is king. It basically in most movies and Steve, when you mention these action things that go on long, perfect for foreign. You don't even have to dub it. There's nothing yeah. to be dubbed. Everyone understands a stupid car chase. Oh, excuse me, a car chase. Yeah, but so our, so our audience, so our audience understands the success of the foreign markets. Somewhere in the early 1980s, they started building. They, they were they were they had World War II or pre World War II movie theaters. 
they were dilapidated in most of these countries. I don't care if it was Italy or France or Germany or what have you. And in the early 80s, they started building the modern complexes, the modern theater complexes. And they're now all over these foreign countries. I don't care if it's Finland or Bolivia or Switzerland. You're going into a really nice movie theater. And once that happened and the, the price became high, uh, it, be, it became a gold mine. So, uh, and the, the world, as great as the United States is, the world is a bigger market uh, and mass than it is in the U.S. It's true of, of other things as well, but in the movies and television shows, uh, you need to have the rom com as great as it is and can be maybe domestic. Somehow they don't think it can convert to overseas uh, business. Uh, and that's a problem. And finally, right. finally, from my point of view on women directors, Elaine May became the only woman director in the 1970s making Hollywood movies. In the 1970s. And that was New Leaf and Heartbreak Kid and Mikey and Nikki. Of course, New Leaf was the end of the 60s, but that was a very interesting uh, time. And yet she was the only woman any Hollywood studio making movies. Oh, she's, uh, Julian, you know, I, I'm aware of your relationship with her. You're very friends with her for so many years. She's funny. Uh, she thinks funny. She talks funny. Uh, whether it was with Mike Nichols and Nichols and May or whether she was directing or Elaine May is, is a, is a, a genius of comedy. Uh, yeah. she's funny. Yeah. You know that. She make you laugh in person? Seriously. Oh my God. Yes. No? Absolutely. There's no question. Mm -hmm. I remember quickly. She was ill one day, and we were trying to find a doctor in August. Couldn't find a doctor in August because they're all on vacation. But we finally got a doctor. I said, Elaine, Elaine, here, here's a doctor. Talk to him. And she goes, hello, doctor. How am I? <laughs> <laughs> She's not very the, good in interviews, is she? <laughs> the, the, Julian, the, the thing that she did with uh, Mike Nichols when he's coming uh, for a funeral, and she's the funeral director. Oh yes, that piece is as funny as anything I've ever seen. Yeah, she was the call. But she said, "I'll introduce you. I'm the grief lady." <laughs> All right. <laughs> and when she says to him, "What about? Would you like some extras?" And he said, "Like, like what?" She says, "The casket." The casket. <laughs> <laughs> no, and the amazing thing, they had no writers. Mike and Elaine wrote all of that. There were no yeah. writers. Almost every comp comedian we all know. Have writers. They wrote their own. They wrote their own. So, yeah, I, I, uh, I must say that, uh, she is quite something. And, uh, did she write Birdcage? I loved Birdcage. She God. wrote it. Oh, she absolutely did. No. Yeah. Yeah. It was that a remake. Of the of, it was a remake of a French movie. But right, she, Le Cage Fall. Yeah. Le Cage Fall. One of but, the funniest movies of all time. Just yeah. funny. And, and whoever <laughs> thought Gene Hackman could be that funny? Oh my God! He's, you know, I, I miss Gene Hackman because uh, he he's such a a force. I know he's totally retired now. I was just I, I was enjoying that piece you sent me, Arthur, about him being uh, discussed by William Friedkin about Julian French. sent that. Julian sent that. Oh, that Julian was great. sent that. Yeah, that was terrific. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, let's give credit where credit's due. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny thing just to get off the beat track. Billy Friedkin, I call him Billy Energy. Uh, he was the most passionate. He could be. I had a donut the other day. You wouldn't believe this donut. You know, he was just a passionate guy. That, that's what George Burns said about Jack Benny. He'd say, "Yes." Jack Benny would say, "This is the greatest glass of water I've ever drank in my life." <laughs> and we should say we talked about Sherry Lansing. She married Billy Friedkin. Yes. It all comes back to Sherry. <laughs> you know. You know, one one woman we never mentioned at all who was a giant, giant star was Greta Garbo. And and Greta Garbo played tough, tough women in her in her films. And Ninochka especially, at least at the beginning, until she was tamed by a man, I guess. Where were you when they made Garbo Talks? A movie, a movie that went nowhere. In New York City with Sidney yeah. Lumet and uh, Annie Bancroft was, I think, one of the leads in that, I think. Did Sidney Lumet direct that movie? I believe so. What do you think, Steve? Well, I'll have to look it up real quick. But well, uh, Sidney Lumet is one of my favorite Your instincts directors. are usually pretty good. I think I'm right, but, you know, who knows? After all, um, 
Uh, did senior, you know? Did you did you know Sidney Lumet, uh, Julian? I knew him very well. Uh, yeah. he was Garbo intense. talks directed by Sidney Lumet. Uh, Absolutely good. right. Good. No, I knew, I'd like to mention. I I'd, I'd like to mention a lady who I was very fond of. She was a Fox contract player, became a, a big star in her own way, and an Oscar winner was Susan Hayward. Oh. Susan Hayward won the Oscar for Best Actress for a movie called I Want to Live. And uh, I think I may have mentioned this another time, but I'll repeat it. That um, uh, Let's see. Let me remember his name. I'm trying to think of the name of the writer. I'll, it'll come to me in a second. But he told me he was working with with an actor who had the rights to Casino Royale, the first James Bond novel. He brought it over to Fox. Gregory Ratoff was his name. He was a prominent actor, character actor. Russian, and they Russian, it. Russian. Russian, the Russian. He's very Russian. Russian. And he was grooming. Su- uh, they, uh, there was talk of Susan Hayward playing a female James Bond uh, to turn the character of James Bond into a woman in the first James Bond movie. This is mid-1950s, long before Cubby Broccoli and Harry Saltzman got the rights. So our history could have been very different if Susan Hayward had debuted as Jane Bond. Susan Hayward was a wonderful actress. She had great sex appeal. She was one of my dream girls. I love Susan Hayward. Well, uh, you know, in, ha- in House of Strangers, she's incredible. She plays the toughest woman you want to meet. Yeah, she's uh, a good actress. And, and with Richard Conti trying to... Uh, Bed her, and eventually she goes after I had the, him. We had a we had a movie theater in Fall River, Massachusetts, uh, that we were expanding from six screens to ten screens or something. And our manager called us and said, uh, "There's an older actress who lives down here. She's in a church rectory. She works in the church, but I think she was a star. Her name is Betty Hutton." Oh, oh. honest to God, about 1986 there about, and so uh, we d- had him. Tell her that we would like to mention, would like to add her name to one of the auditoriums of the, of the theater, call it the Betty Betty Hutton Auditorium. If she would be kind enough to come to our opening, uh, and she did, and so we got to talk to her, Betty Hutton. She was a big star when she was working in the church church rectory. She confided to us. She told us that she had been through. She went through nine million dollars. She made. She was a big star, and anybody from that era would, would remember Betty Hutton. And Annie Get Your Gun and uh, Pearls of Pauline. And Greatest something. show on earth. Greatest show on earth, yes. Big star. She, she told me that if you went to Broadway and 42nd Street, you could have found me in 1970, whatever it was, uh, laying face down in the grates. That's how, that's how low she got. Uh, Eddie and she, Hutton, really? Eddie Hutton. And she, she found her way through a, a church to this uh, church in uh, in uh, in Fall River, and she she changed her life. She actually came back and was doing dinner theater and what have you. In her case, uh, you know, Christ was was uh, was the miracle of, of Betty her, sa- her savior, her, her savior, absolutely. And uh, she couldn't have been nicer. Uh, the auditorium remained the Betty Hutton Auditorium, and she was all I think you'll recall a big star. Mike, would you have heard of her? Nope. Sorry, before my there's talk. a funny there's a funny scene in Sunset Boulevard where William Holden is pleading with this producer to give him a job, and the producer uh, Fred Clark was his name, great great actor. He was in the apartment, uh, no, not in the apartment. He was in uh, Don't Go Near the Water. But Fred Clark is saying, well, "Let me see, maybe we can make it a Betty Hutton. We need we need you know Betty Hutton movies on this line. They're trying to turn his his story about." Uh, baseball player into a softball player. It was just really a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. He was he was a great character actor, by the way. Fred Clark. Oh, Fred oh yeah. Clark was terrific. He was the original neighbor with Burns and Allen. He was uh, the original neighbor. Uh, sure. In, on the TV show. By the way, I'd like to mention an actress who probably kept Fox afloat during the Great Depression, which would mean that she pretty much was empowered, even though she was probably only six years old. And that would be Shirley Temple. Yeah. She kept the studio going. She was the highest grossing actress in the business. In the and not only that, but one of the greatest talents that ever lived. If you see her as a child actress, she was unbelievable. I mean, she was Tiger Woods. And she was, she was, she was the Taylor the, Swift of her day. Well, she, oh, she was, no, no. 
Taylor Swift is, is not as talented as, as Shirley Temple was a pure talent. Uh, all you have to do is look at some of those movies. Watch her oh. dancing with Bill Bojangles Robinson when she was six, seven, eight years old. She was incredible. And later on, went to be on to become the ambassador to the United Nations, I believe. Uh, no, the ambassador to Ghana. I think to she Ghana. Uh huh. But I think she also, I, I may be wrong, but I thought she also was the ambassador at one point to the United Nations, but I may be wrong. Yes. I think it was to a couple of countries rather than the UN. But she came this close to being Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. Zanuck would not let he her go. He would not let her go. He would he not, would let, not her let her go. And in reality, I think Judy Garland found the role that was so memorable. And that's another person, by the way, who was empowered in a certain way, although she was ruthlessly manu- manipulated by her own studio. But Judy Garland found her place. And by her managers and agents. And her agents. Yeah. And her agents. Interestingly enough, when Arthur mentions Betty Hutton, Judy Garland was the original Annie and Annie Get Your Gun and had, right. had to be let go. And that's how Betty got the role. What was her biggest picture? Would it be uh, Greatest Show on Earth, Steve? Well, her biggest film, Betty Hutton? I mean, you Annie really, Get Your Gun, I think. You, yeah, you can't call Greatest Show on Earth Betty Hutton's movie, you know. It is can't, but you can call Annie Get Your Gun her movie. I think. And who who was the guy who who co-starred with her in Annie Get Your Gun? Is it Howard Keel? Yes, sir. Yeah, I thought so. And who wrote the music? Irving, Irving B. Irving, Irving the hitmaker. Oh my God! Oh every my song, God. every song in that show was a hit. Incredible, but incredible. One of the cool. actresses you guys didn't bring up that's interesting was Hedy Lamarr. If you want to, yes. Her. A great, um, in, a great inventor. Well, that's exactly where I was about to go. We would not be talking to each other right now like this if it wasn't for Hedy Lamar. Because she invented basically Wi-Fi. And yes. she helped design it for the U.S. Army to, you know, basically spot missiles and stuff with the radar and such. It's pretty. What amazing. a story. Mike, what a story. Uh, Hedy Lamar. Uh, wow. By the way, Betty Hutton's. Uh, her top movies, according to IMDb, Annie Gets Your Gun, The Greatest Show on Earth, and the Preston Sturgis movie, The Miracle of Morgan's Creek. Great, great movie. That's right. She was one of those characters. Yep. And, uh, she made it to 2007. She uh, died at the age of 86. Yeah. God bless her. She was really saintly, I'm telling you. Uh, she was such a nice, nice person. Who made it back? She made it back from, I mean, first, you go through $9 million. In those days, probably like more like $30, $40 million today. And uh, with all of the mistakes and the husbands and God knows what. Uh, and to sink to becoming a vagrant, someone who was one of the biggest stars in the world, becoming a vagrant. And then coming back, with all due respect, through the church. So there you go. Um, I'd like to mention another actress because I think even though she wasn't so much empowered in her first film. She's become a force in the horror field. And that would be Jamie Lee Curtis. All those Halloween movies cannot be dismissed lightly. And she became a fighter. She started out being the one being chased and eventually she chases down Michael Myers. So we've come to the end of our show this week. I just want to say thank you to all our fans who've been listening uh, if you haven't joined our podcast, please sign up. It's absolutely free. Uh, we love communicating with you. Send us an email. Send us anything and say, uh, go to talesfromhollywoodland at gmail.com. Tell us what you think of our show. We love hearing good and bad because from the bad we learn. Right, guys? Absolutely. And we want more co-hosts, Steve. We like if you want to be a co-host on Tales from Hollywood Land and you've got a subject in the entertainment field that you want to talk about, send us an email. We just had our first co-host last week, and that's our show. Uh, that was a terrific show. Also, we're on all the podcasts now, the platforms, Amazon, Spotify, Apple, uh, and the, your favorite podcast. We are there, and we have, uh, we have a Facebook page. We've got an Instagram page. And our producer, Mike Favor, is working on getting us a YouTube, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because we're, going to, end, we're going to end with two of the great titles of country western music. One is My Wife Ran Off With My Best Friend and I Sure Do Miss Him. <laughs> and another one is She Got the Gold Mine and I Got the Shaft. <laughs>
Country Western titles. Yes, sir. You know what happens when you play a country western song backwards? You get back your house, you get back your dog, you get back your girl, and you get back your car. (laughs) Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. All right, monkeying around, start talking. Mr. Bobalina, about your podcast. We talk about an Emmy-winning comedy series. We talk about a band who outsold the Beatles and the Stones in 1967. Still sticking to that story, huh? Well, if you know what's good for you, you'll change your tune. We talk about a groundbreaking multimedia project. That inspired generations of artists and fans. All right, throw the book at them. This book is overdue. Monkeying Around, a podcast about the monkeys. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping for the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek. <laughs>